So this talk will be about the Riemann-Roch theorem for genus one curves. More precisely, we'll be showing how to use the genus, the Riemann-Roch theorem to classify genus one curves. So previously, we showed that if we take a copy of the projective line, then this satisfies the Riemann-Roch theorem uh, in the case of genus naught. And conversely, we showed that if we've got a curve satisfying the Riemann-Roch theorem for genus zero, then it must be a copy of the projective line. We also showed that if we've got an elliptic curve of the form C modulo a lattice, then this satisfies the Riemann-Roch theorem for genus one. And what we're going to do today is to show that if we've got a curve satisfying the Riemann-Roch theorem for genus one, then you can write it as the complex numbers modulo a lattice. Um, so suppose C is a curve satisfying the Riemann-Roch theorem um, for genus one. Now the Riemann-Roch theorem in the case of genus one says that L of D is equal to the degree of D plus L of K minus D, where as usual K is the canonical divisor and L is the space dimension of the space of functions with poles only on D. Um, as usual, we find that degree of K is equal to zero and L of K uh, is equal to one from this. So the Riemann-Roch theorem becomes L of D is equal to degree of D whenever degree of D is greater than zero, because in that case, the degree of this will be less than zero, so it just vanishes. So what we want to do is to try and classify curves satisfying this condition. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to pick a point P on the curve, and then we're going to look at the dimension of N of P for N equals zero, one, two, three, and so on. Um, where you recall this is the dimension of the space of functions which have a pole of order at most n at the point p and no poles elsewhere. So uh, let's just calculate this using the Riemann-Roch theorem. Well this is pretty easy. So we just take n to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, five or six, and then what L of NP? Well, um, L of zero is always just one, and then by the Riemann-Roch theorem, these numbers are one, two, three, four, five, and six. So it's almost linear, except for there's a sort of little glitch when you go from zero to one. And let's try and figure out what functions you get. Well, here we get the space of constants, which is obviously spanned by one. Here, well, the dimension of L of P is the same as the dimension of L of zero, so we get nothing new. So there are no new functions. Here, the dimension goes up by one, so we get a new function. Let's call it X, which has a pole of order two. And uh, similarly, when we go up to here, we get a new function. And let's call it y, which has a pole of order three. And here, you may think we get a new function, but we don't really, because the new function we get has a pole of order four, but it's pretty obvious what that is. We can just take this function of the pole of order two and square it. So we just get x squared. Um, when we go to a pole of order five, well, we can get that by multiplying x and y together. So we get x, y. And when we go to six, well, we can get a pole of order six by multiplying y by itself, or we can multiply x by itself three times. So, well, we can now stop here because if we count up, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven functions living inside a six dimensional vector space. That means there must be a linear relation between them. So we get a linear relation of the following form. It says ay squared plus by plus cxy equals dx cubed plus e x squared plus f times x plus g for some 
A, B, C, D, E, F, G in the complex numbers. Um, so this is giving us a curve in um, P3. Sorry, in P2, I guess. Um, and we can simplify it as follows. So first of all, we can just change y to y plus a constant, and this will eliminate the term um, um, b times y, at least if the characteristic is not equal to is not equal to two, because if we do that, we, we can't always get rid of that. Similarly, we can change y to y plus constant times x, and this will eliminate the term c times x times y. Um, again, if that characteristic isn't two, then we can change x to x plus a constant, and this will eliminate the term in x squared. Then we can change um, y to y times a constant, so that the term in, in y squared has coefficient 1. And then we can change x to x times a constant to make the coefficient of x cubed equal to, well, for historical reasons, we make it equal to 4, not 1. So our equation now looks like y squared equals 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3 for some g2 and g3 in the complex numbers. Again, this notation is done mostly for historical reasons. Um, so this is an affine curve, and we can look at the corresponding projective curve if we like. It's z, z, zy squared is 4x cubed minus g2xz squared minus g3z cubed. So this is a curve in P2. And um, the curve for the curve in P2, the point P that we started with corresponds to the point at infinity, which is just the point where x in, in projective space is the point where x, y, z is equal to 0, 1, 0. So we start with an arbitrary curve. Um, I guess complete or compact, satisfying the riemann roch theorem for genus zero and shown that we can write it in this form, um, assuming it's non-singular and so on. Um, well, now the next question is, how do we show that this is um, C modulo a lattice? Well, the first thing to do is to try and identify what it looks like topologically over the complex numbers. So suppose for any curve, which is of the form y squared equals x minus a, x minus b, x minus c, or y squared equals x minus a, x minus b, x minus c, x minus d. So we're doing this case because we can get it for free. Um, then what we do is we get a map from c to the projective line, just taking a point x, y to uh, the, the point x, and you see this is almost a double cover, except at the points a, b, c, and either zero and either d or infinity. So, um, um, so at the points a or b or c. Um, or either D in this case, or infinity in this case, there, there are two points of the um, curve C that, that map to the same point. So, so what has happened is um, we get C is, is got by um, gluing two, together two copies of P1, except you have to glue them a little bit carefully. So, so, so let's draw the two copies of P1. And we've got these points a, B, C, and either D or infinity on both copies, or rather these are the points that are going to map to D or infinity. And we've got to kind of glue them together. And we sort of glue them together like this. What we do is we, is we cut these open with a, you know, you imagine these being made out of paper or something. You get your pair of scissors and just cut them open so there's a little hole here. 
and then you glue them together. So, and we're going to glue um, this piece to this piece, and we're going to glue this piece to this piece, and this piece to this piece, and that piece to that piece. So, so let's draw what we're getting again. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll draw them slightly differently so you can see them being joined together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to distort them slightly. So now, um, here are the four bits. I'm going to, I've got a green bit and um, a dark blue bit. And I think this was a pink bit and uh, a light blue bit or whatever. And I glue it to a second copy of, so you see, this is, this is just a sphere where I've made a couple of slits in it and then I've deformed it a bit. And I'm gluing that blue bit to that blue bit and this green bit to that green bit. And um, um, maybe I should have done it the other way around to make it a bit less confusing. Um, and if I glue them up like this, you can see that what you're getting is, is just a torus. So it end, ends up looking something like this. So um, in other words, um, the genus of this complex curve in the sense of algebraic topology, where the genus is the number of handles on a sphere, is the same as the genus G that appears in the Riemann-Roch theorem. Um, well, so far, um, we've got our curve as um, a cubic equation in X and Y, but we haven't quite written it as C modulo a lattice. So, so, so we've got two ways of representing it as a, an elliptic curve. We can either write it as the complex numbers modulo a lattice, or we can write it as this plane curve Y squared equals 4X cubed minus G2X minus G3. And how do we get from one to the other? Well, we saw we can get from C modular lattice to the plane curve by taking Y to be the Weierstrass function uh, uh, differentiated and X to be the Weierstrass function. Um, to go back the other way, what we're going to do is to use this magic differential DX over Y. So this is a one form on the curve. And now you may think this one form has got a singularity at y equals zero. And um, the answer is no, it doesn't actually have a singularity at y equals zero. And let's see why. The reason is if we write y squared equals x minus a times x minus b times x minus c, let's forget about this factor of four for the moment. Then you see two y dy, is equal to x minus a x minus b plus x minus b x minus c plus x minus c x minus a times dx. So uh, dx over y is equal to 2y dy um, divided by all this junk here. I guess we should also divide by y. So here we have x minus a x minus b plus all the rest of it. I can't be bothered to write out all over again. And now you see the y's cancel out. And the key point is this thing is non-zero at y equals zero. Because if, if y is equal to zero, then x is equal to a or b or c. And if x is equal to a or b or c, then two of these terms are zero. And the third one is very definitely non-zero because of course A is not equal to B, B is not equal to C, and C is not equal to A. Otherwise, we would have a curve with singularity. So um, um, in this side is now holomorphic at um, Y equals zero. So this, this is also really holomorphic at Y equals zero. It just happens that DX and Y both have a zero at, at these points. So what we've got is a, is a rather nice one form that's actually holomorphic everywhere on the curve. Um, I guess I should have checked the point at infinity as well, but I'm feeling too lazy to do that.
Um, and now what we can do is we can look at the integral from a point P to any other point Z. And we're going to integrate dx over y. So this is going to be some fixed point. And this is going to be some point varying on, on our curve. And the trouble is this isn't really quite well defined because if we draw a um, curve like this, we might have a point P here and a point Z here, but then there are lots of different paths from P to Z. So we can go along here or we could go along here. And these would give different values of this integral. So Cauchy's theorem says that we get the same value if two paths are homotopic. But you know this, this pink path and this green path are certainly not homotopic. So, so this integral is not actually well defined. It depends on the path. Um, well, so what's the ambiguity? Well, um, there are two ambiguities. First of all, um, if we just integrate round a loop like this, we can get something that's non-zero. And secondly, if we integrate round a loop like this, we also might get something non-zero. But um, every loop you can do on the torus is homotopic to an integral multiple of some multiple of the pink loop and some multiple of the green loop. So if we put Omega one is the integral over the pink loop of dx over y, and omega two is the integral over the green loop of dx over y. Then um, the ambiguity of the integral from p to z dx over y is equal to m times omega one plus n times omega two. And this is just a point of a certain lattice L, which is just the lattice generated by omega one and omega two. So, so we've now found the lattice L um, corresponding to our elliptic curve. It's, it's given by the um, ambiguity in this, in this integral here. Um, so what we get is a well-defined map from the curve y equals four x cubed minus g two x minus g3 to the complex numbers modulo this lattice L. Um, so that's how you get from an algebraic curve to the complex numbers modulo a lattice. Okay, that's all for the Riemann rock in genus one. And next we'll be looking at the Riemann rock for genus two.